Today I lift my eyes to the heavens and count my blessings. I think of all my needs that were met today. The clothes on my back. A place to lie down tonight. Nothing miraculous or earth shattering. Just a small thing to help keep me going day after day. Thank you, God. I have a food on my table, help to get me through the day. Good memories I've shared. All the beauty that makes life special. Thank you, God. I'm blessed by what I can see and touch. What I can feel in the moment. But Lord, you transcend feelings and moments. You sacrificed your life so that I could see beyond what's under my feet and over my head. <sighs> Thank you, God. That kind of love keeps my heart free. During seasons where peace is hard to come by, even when I can't see or touch a blessing, I know I can close my eyes and say, thank you, God. I've, I've lost a lot this year. Things I worked hard for. Dreams I was sure were gonna come true. People I never wanted to say goodbye to. I walked a hard path of trial. And pain and despair. But I never walked it alone. Even now, I can say thank you, God. Because no matter what is set before me. Dark valleys or green pastures. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And when this life is over, I'll dwell with you in your house forever. So I just want to stop and tell you. Thank you, God. 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 Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Did you take that time to stop and say, thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. <laughs> and sometimes we don't. Sometimes, you know, I don't know, at my house, everybody's running around and sometimes you don't, but Take that, if you haven't yet, just get away by yourself before God. And just tell Him thank you. Um, every week, sometimes you hear them more than once. But I tell you a story that has something to do with my life. And um, I'll stand up here and I'll say, you know, when I was at this church or when I was a youth pastor or when I was a music pastor or, you know, or when I was in, in school and all of that and begin to share with you a part of my life. Because that's what stories are. Did you know that? Your story is your life. You know, you're, that's why we love stories because they depict somebody's life or something somebody went through. We go to movies because we like stories. And so, um, you know, God has just done a work in my story for me, and hopefully for others. Um, I remember when I first came to know Christ, I was six years old, okay? You know, as I, in my teenage years, I always wondered, you know, you always wonder and question that kind of thing. But when I was six years old, I'll never forget, uh, we had a church service and, and, um, and I remember walking down the aisle as a six-year-old and I got on my knees to an altar similar to this, and a man come alongside of me, and he had a Bible in his hand. <clears throat> and I remember him opening the Bible. I don't remember a whole lot when I was six years old, but I do remember that. I remember him opening the Bible and began to show me, you know, that I was a sinner, even a, you know, even a stinking six-year-old, you know. I was a sinner, that I needed a Savior. And it was Jesus Christ. And I remember that day, I think it was even a Sunday evening service. I remember asking Jesus Christ into my life. And I remember that as a six-year-old, I mean, I wasn't into drugs or drinking or anything like that. <laughs> Not much. No. And, uh, but, but I was, but I knew something had changed in my life. And then over the years, God had done some other things in my life. Uh, when I was about 14, I remember the pulling of God's Spirit into ministry. And I know that's weird because most 14-year-olds, years old, 14 year old, uh, I have, I've had kids that were 14-year-olds, I have grandkids that are 14 years old. Most of them don't think about going into the ministry. They think about, you know, who's my girlfriend or whatever, you know. Um, and <clears throat> my brother had already surrendered his life. 
we used to use that term, surrender our life to preach. And I remember, I just sensed the Spirit of God saying, Steve, I want your life to be about proclaiming my truth. And so I so started then, and I remember just, you know, and I remember getting married very young, and, and uh, some of the trials and testings, and Robin and I, this beautiful lady, still been with me 42 years, and I remember our first, when we first went to school, and, and we're studying, and how tough it was, how difficult, how there were times we had no money. I, there was, this is a true story. One time we had, in, in our refrigerator, I don't know why this combination, but we had root beer, half a two liter of root beer, I don't know what kind it was, and, and about six eggs, something like that. We, had, you know, we were going to eat our root beer and eggs and die. You know, <laughs> my, my brother was a missionary at the time. He came through and helped us out. Um, but there have been many times, you know, we get that check in the mail and we didn't expect it, didn't know what we we're going to do. But God just showed up because we knew that's where God wanted us to be. Just because bad things happened, we knew that wasn't going to deter us from following the Spirit's lead. And then from there, we went to uh, Tennessee. And I, my first year, I was a, I was a music and youth pastor, and uh, the youth pastor I was okay with, the music, you know, I've never, I don't, I can't read music to this day, so I, but I could hear it okay, and, and I could, I knew what parts sounded like and all that, so I did that for a couple of years in this church in Tennessee, and we moved to Texas, and we went through some tough times in Texas, then called, then finally God called me to do what he wanted me to do in Pennsylvania, and you've heard some of the stories in between, how we got to Pennsylvania, and, and God did a work in a very rural area. They're Pennsylvania Dutch area. And, um, and we, so we lived there for about four years, and been here come this next June. We've pastored here for 30 years. And, and so it's just, God, it's just been this incredible, incredible ride. It's been hard, it's been good. But what I'm sharing with you is my story. And by the way, my story is my life. Your story is your life. How's your story coming? I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you to, to sit down and begin to write your story out. Now, I know there's some of you who think, you know, nobody will care. Nobody could care less about my story. Nobody could care less about what I'm going through. And it really doesn't matter to anybody else. I'm here to tell you, you're dead wrong. Your story matters. In fact, what, what God uses to change the hearts and lives of people are stories. Stories of life change. Stories of, I just about didn't make it and God showed up. Anybody got that in your life? I know it's true for me. I didn't think I was going to be able to, to, to go another day, and God showed up. And He does. So I want to encourage you to write your story. Write it down. I bet we got some bestsellers in here. I bet we got some real stories that people need to see and read and hear. Because stories will change. You see, here... Your story is your life. Say that with me. My story is my... Let's do that again. My story is my life. And, and, I, and I want you to think about your story. But today I want to talk about not just your story, but his story. The story of the gospel. The story of Jesus Christ. Now, I have had the honor, I have had the honor to, um, to watch my children's story unfold. And I must tell you that there have been some frightening times, but there have been some wonderful times. There have been some frustrating times, but there have been some incredible times. And now, God has blessed me with ten Ten grandkids. And watching their stories unfold is amazing. It's different than when you're a parent. Because you're not as close, for the most part. But, but you're watching their, their stories. 
in a different place at a different time. You're beginning to watch their stories unfold. And it's an amazing thing to look at. It's an amazing thing to, to see. Your story is important. No matter how important you think you are, your story is vitally important. So many of you today, you have amazing, exciting, exhilarating stories that you could share. But some of you are here today and you live with regret, remorse, resentment, with bitterness, and maybe with a whole lot of shame. Now, I believe this though. Get This is important. You may want to write this down. It's going to be on the screen. I believe if we will surrender our stories to Jesus Christ... He will take our stories and make them a part of His story. Let me say it again. If we will surrender our stories to Jesus Christ, He will take our stories and make them a part of His story. And here's what I found. I found when my story is placed in the midst of His story, I live a life of gratefulness, not hatefulness. Let me say it again. When my story is placed in the midst of His story, I live a life of gratefulness, not hatefulness. Now, let me ask you a really, and you don't have to answer this. This is a rhetorical question, a question you need to answer in your heart. Is your story bringing God glory? Is my story bringing God's glory? Is our story? When God looks at the, 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 the pages of our book, because we all are kind of a book, you know, and we're, and we're writing on each page every day. When God looks at the story of Southeast Community Church, what will He see? Will it be pleasing in His eyes? Oh, that's my heart. Will, will we be a church that it says, well done, you know, that He can say, well done, good and faithful servants? That's my heart. How many remember, uh, and I'm going to date some of you, but you probably listened to this guy and, and maybe your parents did. How many you remember, and he passed away not too long ago, Paul Harvey. You remember Paul Harvey? And now the rest of the story. My dad loved Paul Harvey. He would, he would uh, my dad was blind, and, but he knew what times, because Paul Harvey for the most part only did like five minute segments. And on the radio, and my dad knew what radio station Paul Harvey came on, and he, uh, my dad uh, had this, this uh, ca- remember cassette players? <laughs> that was a radio too, and he had this, this cassette radio, uh, and he knew, he had it tuned, he knew where it was, and he had these big headphones, you know, and so my dad, at certain times of the day, no matter what we were talking about, no matter what we were doing, he says, hold on a minute, Steve. And he'd pull out this, this radio and his headphones. He'd put, he'd listen to the Paul Harvey and the rest of the story. And what Paul Harvey would do is he would tell a story. And then he would say, and now, the rest of the story. And he would begin to talk about some amazing things that happened in those stories that you never would think, that you never thought would happen. You see this, get this, folks. What you do with the rest of your story will determine if you live a life of gratefulness or hatefulness. You have your life, you have your story, and it's being written. If you say, well, I don't want to write it, it's being written anyway. Well, I don't want to deal with that, Pastor Steve. That's, I don't even want to talk about that. Your story's being written anyway. It's being written. You see... Here's the truth about who you are. You're not one in a million, folks. You're one in six billion. And the Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And your story is unique. And more important than anything else, your your story is yours. What you do with your story will determine how you're going to live the rest of your life. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 21. And Paul is, is, is in Jerusalem. Now, we know from earlier studies that Paul was told by many prophets, many people who loved him. They said, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, 
you're going to be in prison. One guy even took his belt off, Paul's belt off, and, and hogtied himself. And he says, this is what your life is going to look like if you go to Jerusalem. And so Paul was, Paul was being uh, admonished. He was being encouraged. He was being challenged not to go to Jerusalem because if you go to Jerusalem, there's a group of people just waiting to tear into you and kill you. But Paul says, I'm not going because I want to go. I'm not going because it's going to be, you know, because it's going, I'm going because God's sending me. And so Paul goes to Jerusalem. When he goes, the prophecies come true. He gets, you know, a crowd. In fact, there's a riot almost that begins. <clears throat> and they're beating Paul. <clears throat> and they're trying to, to, to kill him. They would kill him. The Roman guards come in. They pull him out. <clears throat> and they rescue him. And in, and in chapter um, 21, you know, he, in fact, they say at, the, at, the, at, the, at the, uh, verse 36, the last uh, four words are get rid of him. In fact, they're the same words that were used uh, when they had Barabbas and Jesus on trial, and they said, what do we do with Jesus? Well, they said, crucify him. But they said, away with him. In other words, kill him. Crucify him. We don't want anything to do with him. And that's what they're saying to Paul here. Get rid of him. <clears throat> kill him. We'll kill him if you don't kill him. We don't want anything to do with him. <clears throat> so in verse 37, <clears throat> as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander. He found the tribune, the guy that was in charge, and he said, he said, may I say something to you? And do you speak Greek? The guy replied. That, and uh, verse 38, the commander, he says, wait, I know who you are. He says, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? There was a revolt and and actually about 30,000 people followed. They were trying to overthrow Rome. It was a cult. And, uh, and the Roman, of course, the Roman army squashed and squelched that. And uh, there was about 4,000 that took off to the desert. It was led by an Egyptian. And uh, they never found the leader. And so this guy thought he hit the jackpot. He thought when he got Paul, he got this, this cult leader, or this leader of, uh, of, of the people that were rising against Rome. And so... And so he says, and Paul answered, verse 39, he says, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Now, he, he, he's very careful about when he tells people uh, that he's a Roman citizen. He doesn't come out with that yet. He says, please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's position, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd, and there was a motion that he was going to speak. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, some believe that he might have used Hebrew, but it was probably Aramaic, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. That was a Jewish-Palestine language, and it was a language that many people understood. In fact, at Pentecost, uh, when he spoke in tongues, of course, he spoke in the language and everybody heard their own language. But when he spoke, when he wasn't speaking that way, he spoke in Aramaic. And, and the people of Pentecost that came from different parts of the world understood what he was saying. So they were quiet. They, they, they gave him the platform. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a Cilicia. Now, Tarsus was an interesting place, especially for the Jews, because Tarsus was the place that... Uh, that king, excuse me, that Caesar Augustus rewarded um, because, because when there was, remember the battle of Brutus and Cassius and they killed Caesar and all that, uh, that they sided with Rome and, and, and Caesar Augustus awarded them uh, for that. He says, so that's why Tarsus, he mentions, of course, that's where he's from. But brought up in the city, I stuttered, studied under Gamaliel, who was thoroughly trained, he was, a, he was a high-ranking Pharisee, and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors, and the Jews knew this. I was just as zealous for God than any of you are today. Now, now, here's what he does. He has an opportunity to talk to this Jewish crowd, and he doesn't use necessarily theology. <laughs> he doesn't come and say, now here's what I believe. He doesn't try to, you know, he doesn't try to argue points, 
He doesn't try to, you know, convince everybody based on Old Testament scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Here's what he does. He simply says, this is what happened to me. This is what I went through. This is what changed and transformed my life. Folks, listen to me. The reason a lot of people do not share the gospel of Jesus Christ is because they think they're not educated enough. They think they don't know enough Bible, and when I learn enough Bible, then I'll start. Listen, learn from Paul, who does this again, by the way. When he stands before his people, he doesn't try to convince them theologically. He tries to share with them personally, and he does. He says, this is my story. And folks, you know, they can take a whole lot away from us, but they can't take our story away from us. <clears throat> they can laugh at us. They can, make, they can say what we believe is just is, is not true. They can say whatever they want. They can't take your story away from you. And so Paul begins to open up his heart and share what happened. Now what he does first here is he begins to share his life B.C., before Christ. Notice what he says. He says, verse 4, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death. This is what he says, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can, test, can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them <clears throat> to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. He said, I was on my way to Damascus, which is 170 miles from uh, Jerusalem. I got papers from the Jewish leaders. I had the full authority from, from my own people, from my own leaders, to capture, to torture, to imprison those people who were starting this thing called the way. My life's goal, my life's focus was to get rid of Christianity is basically what he was, what he was saying. <clears throat> Then he says in verse 6, this is this, by the way, let me say this. You may want to write this somewhere in your Bible. This is when Paul's story became his story. This is when everything changed. This is when his past was only a tool to use to bring people to Christ. This was the, this was the pivotal point in his life. Verse 6, about noon, as I came near Damascus, Suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then Saul says, who are you, Lord? And notice what he says. He says, I am Jesus of, who, of what? Yeah. Now he doesn't say that. We don't have that recording in the first account of Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. But here he says, Jesus of Nazareth. You know, that place where no good comes from? I mean, kind of like coming from Woodbine, right? Just, just kidding, okay? <laughs> Is that okay, Martin? Huh? No, are you from Woodbine? No. <laughs> you get a, week, a weekend at the Starlight Hotel. Is that what it is? <laughs> Stardust Hotel? <laughs> All right, but anyway, back to the message. Okay. So, so Jesus says, he's Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, you, the, people knew who he was. He says, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. In other words, stuff was going on. The people that were with Paul when he was, when he was coming to Christ didn't have a clue what was, what was being said. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. And here's what Jesus said to him. Get up, the Lord said. Go to Damascus. Don't you, you're you're going to hate this answer. Because this is the same answer, kind of answer that we get. He says, go to Damascus. There you will be told what, what you have been dis assigned to do. Don't you hate that? When, I know people, when they get ready to follow Jesus Christ, God, just tell me what to do. Right? I mean, God, send me a text. Shoot me an email. You know, Message me on Facebook, you know, or Twitter. Anybody tweet? <laughs> you 
You know, whatever you do, send me a snail mail. I don't care. Call me on the phone. Doesn't matter. Tell me what to do. But Jesus doesn't do that with Paul, does he? He says, I want you to go and wait. <clears throat> you know, that's the normal reply from God. He says, I want you to go to wait because while you're waiting, I want you to get this. This is important. I want you to trust me. <clears throat> you don't know me very well yet. You just, you just were converted. You were just regenerated or your, your dead soul was made new in Christ. And, and just wait because I've got something I really want to do in your life. And so maybe you're at a waiting period, right? Maybe you're kind of sitting in Damascus yourself. And God says, wait, but he'll, he'll, he'll respond. He'll talk to you. He says, um, my companions led me by the hand to Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Verse 12, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Verse 14. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. Read this next verse with me, will you? You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. Now that sounds exciting, but the word witness is where we get our word martyr from. Here's what he said. You're going to go and be my martyr. You're going to pay the price for, for sharing the gospel with your own life. Now, I don't know about you, but how many would sign up for that? You know? I'm, I'm just going to give it all. It's tough. He said, Paul, this is what you're going to do. <clears throat> and now, what are you waiting for? Here's what he says. Now, don't, this could be a misunderstood scripture, so stay with me. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Another translation would say, get up, be immersed, and wash your sins away by calling on his name. Let me just say something real quick. You can never find all truth in one scripture. The Bible backs itself up. You know, that's how cults get started. They'll find a little scripture, take it out of context, and make it their whole doctrinal platform. The Bible teaches in the New Testament that baptism was never to be a way to get you to heaven. Baptism was a sign and a symbol, even in this text. Get baptized, it's a sign, it's a symbol. It'll let the Jewish people know, it'll let the people around you know that, that you're no longer a persecutor of believers. You are a believer. And call upon the name. That's, he was already saved. So the baptism was to show the people of who Jesus Christ is and, and what he's done for him. He goes on to say this. <clears throat> he says, When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, Leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Verse 19, Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. Now he gets real personal here. Notice what he says. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen, you guys remember Stephen? They all knew who he was. One of the leaders of the church was shed. I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing them, killing him. So he says, I'm the guy that was watching the clothes and giving approval while Stephen was being brutally stoned to death. <clears throat> you want to know who I was? This is not somebody else. This is not some person. Who's, I used to be a Pharisee. He says in one Scripture, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees until I met Jesus. And he changed everything. See, that's the story of Paul's life. And that's the story of many of our lives. I was this, I was that, I was doing this, I was doing that, and then I met Jesus. And when I met Jesus, everything changed. 
Here's what happened at salvation. I don't know if you've thought about it this way, but here's what actually took place. The rights to your story were bought by Jesus Christ. Think about that. The rights to your story, <clears throat> Jesus Christ purchased with his blood. And what's really neat about what we're going to be doing here in just a few minutes with communion, what's really neat about that is it's a way of us saying, now your story becomes our story. Now your life, death, burial, and resurrection, your life becomes our life. Because here's, if you want to know the real truth, here's our story. Before Christ, we are headed for death, destruction, and hell. That's our story. You know, have you ever watched a movie and it didn't end right? You know what I'm talking about? You watch the movie and, and, you know, all of us love happy endings, don't we? I mean, it wasn't like a Rocky movie, you know, you know but, but, uh, but it was a movie and all of a sudden when it was done, you sat there and went, that, that, that was kind of bad. Maybe the main character died or it just didn't turn out right. And you look at that and you say, boy, why did I waste my money on this? It may have been a, a, a great movie until it didn't end the way it was supposed to end, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? Your, your life is like a movie. Without Christ, it's going to end bad. Okay? Bottom line. It's not going to end well. <sighs> but when you come to Jesus Christ, He says, okay, I'm going to take this bad ending and I'm going to give you a good life. I'm going to give you... There will be no ending. You will live with me eternally. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that means is we can't make the mark. We all fall short. Our stories will all end bad. Also, the Bible also says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is, you know, is what? Death. The payment for your sin and my sin is eternal death. But it doesn't end there. It says, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus looked at our story and he says it's going to end bad. But I don't want it to end bad. So God sent Jesus, sent his only begotten son to come to this earth, die on an old rugged cross, shoulder your sin and my sin, was buried and resurrected again. And when we do this, this communion here, Scripture says, as often as you do it, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, this is a memorial. This is to remind you, listen, get this, that your story is not going to end bad. You may be going through a tough time right now. Your story may be, or you feel like it's coming to an end. Your story may be difficult right now. But because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because he died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried, and rose again, your story is going to end well if you trusted him. And so in just a few minutes, we're going to, we're going to um, take communion. But let, let me give you the bottom line real quick. It's real simple. Would you read this with me? <clears throat> May the rest of our story be about God's glory. Would you read that again? May the rest of our story be about God's glory. And may it be. That's what I want mine to be. Because here, from this day on, listen to me. Stay with me. If you hadn't watched, just catch me on this. From this day on is the rest of your story. What will it be? What or who will you live for? Maybe today, as we take communion in just a minute, what you, need, you and I need to do is say, God, we know this is true. You've given us this wonderful thing called salvation. Yet after we take communion today, we're going we're, we're gonna to make, not only, we're going to take communion remembering what you did. We're going to say, God, if there's sin in our lives that we need to get rid of, God, would you take it? But 
from now on, this communion will be kind of a memorial to me as well that my story is not no longer my own. I sold the rights, in a sense, to Jesus Christ who paid for my story with His blood. I could not have survived without Him. So now my life is His life. And so when you partake of communion, the bread, the body that was bruised, battered, and beaten on our behalf, the blood, the, the only cleansing agent that can get rid of your guilt and your shame and your sin. Today, you can say, oh, I remember and I thank you that my story has a wonderful ending. Now, we're going to do communion. We've been doing it a little bit different. And I want to I want to share it with you because I made a mistake. We did the walk to Emmaus. And, uh, and I'm a Baptist, okay? And we, we always did the communion where you hand it out, you know, hand out the little things and you hand out the... And that's not a wrong way to do it, but that, <laughs> that's all I knew. And so, so I go up, my communion... My, you, some of you heard this story, but I'm reminding you so you don't do it, okay? And, uh, and so Pastor Burningham, who used to be the... Pastor First Baptist was, he was doing the blood. And some, I think it was Martin. Martin was doing the, the, the bread. And I took the bread and he said, he said, this blood, Steve, is, 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 is given freely for you. I mean, this bread was given freely for you. And I, so I, I took a bite of it and ate it. And then I walked over to where the blood part was, you know, and I didn't have a cracker. I didn't have anything. And I thought, I thought, and he, he kind of looked at me and said, Steve, this blood is for you. And I'm thinking, well, I haven't, I already ate it. You know, and so he, I said, I blew it. He just smiled at me and, walk, and I walked away. <laughs> so what you do is you take this. If you're from the same background as me, you can be confused, but it's real simple. And, and my wife is going to help me and there's going to be some others here that are going to join to help out. And uh, she'll say to you, she'll say, this is Christ's body given for you. And then you'll take it. Don't eat it, okay? And you'll dip it into the juice and, and I'll say, this is Christ's blood freely given for you, and then you can partake of it, okay? Um, here's what I, I ask. When this is finished, when we finally go through everybody and we do communion, the service is over, okay? There's no more to the service in here. I'm going to ask that we be very reverent, that when we come, that no, there be no talking or joking. You can do that out there. When you're done, when you're finished, please go on out there and you can... You know, you can go get your kids and, or leave them or whatever. And I'm just kidding. Don't leave your kids. But, um, okay, and so but let's make this a time because some people, we're going to have some people set up. Come on up. If you guys are going to do communion, come on up. Those that are doing communion, come on up. And those who are praying with others, come on up as well. We're going to have prayer people on this, by the stairs over there. If you need to pray, but maybe before you come or maybe you want to pray with somebody after, you're welcome to do that. These, um, these are going to be set up. Prayer people are going to be set up both sides. And so, um, yeah, you're over here. <laughs> and, uh, okay, and they'll pray with you. And uh, if you want to just pray up here, you can do that as well. But this is a time where, remember, well, here's what we're saying. God, we're taking our story and we're giving it to you so that our lives can be your story. And we can do that only because my sin has been paid for by the by the broken body of Jesus Christ and by the blood that was shed by our Savior. Notice I never say the blood that was spilt. You know, you ever spilt milk? Oop, it's an accident. Jesus' blood wasn't spilt. He didn't just, he shed that blood. He gave that blood for you. So what we're going to do, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to invite you to come. There's going to be three different places you can come. You can go to, you know, Rocky and uh, Martin or Mary and Bob. You can come and they'll administer the communion to you. Robin and myself will be here. Uh, but after we pray, we're going to invite you just to come. When you're finished, the service will be over and you can go back and uh, let's just have this time where let's just kind of take a deep breath, okay? Not worry about the stuff that's going around us. And focus in on who he says when you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. If there's sin in your life, don't take it till you get till you get it confessed. Confess it. He forgives it. If you're here today and you're not a believer, you do please do not take it because it won't mean anything to you. 
And if you're here and you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, we invite you to partake his communion, to take your story and make it a part. Let him have it and be a part of his story. Father, I pray that you do a work in this service today. May the Spirit of God move. As we partake in communion, God, may this be a special time, not just something we do, not a ritual we go through, not something we do just, some people do it every week, some people do it every month. And Father, I know it's not wrong any of those ways, but God, may this be a special time where we remember what you've done for us. And may we be grateful. May we be thankful. And may we allow this day to inspire and encourage us to follow you with full surrender. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me.